I'm very exciting to um, greet you, Joseph, Rabbi Joseph Avery. Um, we, I have to say we are a bit late. We have already uh, Thursday, so we didn't make it to our normal Monday uh, Zoom call. But that had a very, very good reason. And I'm very excited to hear about what you all have to tell us about your visit to the Knesset in line of the Sanhedrin initiative and the many meetings you had. Um, because it's, um, I think it's the, the most exciting development. I'm really excited. You know, it's historic, prophetic and unprecedented. So how, you know, give us a wrap up. Just jump in, please. Please. All right. Thank you. First of all, thank you all for having me and uh, hosting us all this time. The exciting developments that we had is that we made it on Sunday to Rabbi Tzvi Idan, which 18 years ago was the head of the Sanhedrin um, that was put together with our Steinsaltz and Hillel Weiss. And we spoke with him at length. We have the full video on YouTube as well as you know on our website and so on. And he gave us really, uh, he gave us the smicha that he got from Rabbi Avadia Yosef and from another great rabbi in the Litvisher world. And they had the 70 rabbis in Tiveria and they had a system they put together for that smicha. And he gave it to me and uh, honorable rabbi uh, Moshe Cohen, which arrived with me as well, <coughs> from the advisory board. Now, so that was a very, very important thing to connect back to the earlier Sanhedrin. Uh, yes, it's something in my nature whenever these kind of things happen because Yosef manages to get his children to get blessings as if they are on the same level as the tribes. So me. If I can connect to the older generation um, and at least have a moment where I have some kind of a common ground with them, for me, that's like the fulfillment of, of Yosef's job. So in that context, I was very happy to meet Svi Idan. He was very yeah, impressed by what we're doing. And he I gave us his blessing and there, we added Joseph. to the judges. Can I please jump in there? Because, um, you know, I knew immediately when you told me that you received the smicha, I knew immediately what that meant. But uh, for a lot of people who are new to Torah, especially those uh, of our ultra-Orthodox Noahites who are, you know, in the footsteps of Yehoshua, you know, slowly, slowly uh, getting along. So please, would you explain to everybody what that sig significance of the smicha is, especially in the realm of putting a judge into his position? Could you... Please elaborate on this. Okay, so smicha really, the proper way for smicha is that Moshe gave smicha to Yehoshua. That means he gave him the responsibility of teaching the Torah. It's almost like the patent, the copyrights. Yes. You know, this is the legal law. Yes. Hand it to well, Yehoshua. Yehoshua, oh, come to the Zikanim. <laughs> <laughs> the Zikanim are the 70 sages. This is the Sanhedrin. And yes. the Zikanim gave it to the prophets. And the prophets gave it to the the people of the great assembly yes. and this continued on and on and on and on till in uh, in the times of uh, Constantinople uh, they they killed the rabbis they went specifically to go stop the smicha from continuing in the Jewish people so that's the 1400s around so at that point um, the smicha was discontinued but the Rambam steps in like we know that the Rambam is Moshe Mi Moshe Ad Moshe Lo Kam Ke Moshe from Moses to to the Rambam which his name is Moses there was no such Moshe and the Rambam came he puts together according to Jewish law how to reset the smicha should the chain be broken yes and he says that you get Rov Chachmei Israel many sages from that generation they come together the, the greatest sages, the scholars of the Jewish people, ultra-Orthodox, uh, you know, keep the Torah law and everything. They can restart the Sanicha process. Again, the giving over of the Torah with permission. And this is a very high level. Um, this was restarted in the time of the Beis Yosef, which was a time when most of the rabbis in Israel 
were in Sfas and uh, they started it again specifically for this purpose, to reset the Smicha and to reset the Sanhedrin eventually. They were not able to do the Sanhedrin, but they started the Smicha. Today, the double Smicha that Rabbi Tzvi Idan has was not only the smicha, the accepted smicha today that we have, which started from the from the people in Sfas, but this is a double smicha from the highest rabbis in Israel 18 years ago. So he got Rav Ovadia Yosef, which is the big greatest rabbi yes. in Israel from at the, the time, Sadim. and the another rabbi from the from the Sfaradim. And what the call we need to dismiss one second. So I'm sorry about that. Here we are. So, so Rabbi Tzvi Idan received an extra smicha from the greatest rabbis today, including another 70 rabbis, which got together in the city of Tveria and gave him the smicha and appointed him the head uh, nasi of the Sanhedrin. So when we come to visit him now with our initiative and he gives me that smicha, and he gives Rabbi Moshe Cohen that smicha. He is really uh, almost like a backup plan or entrusting the work of, of the earlier smicha to uh, the earlier rabbis to us, to our initiative. Of course, he is part of the, the, the judges and we wish him, you know, we wish to hopefully with Hashem's help be able to uh, put together the Sanhedrin in, uh, in time. You know, the, the, the older generation are... Uh, Oops. Well. So by Rabbi Tzvi Idan handing us the Sanhedrin, it's almost like a backup plan for the younger generation. That, that's how I see it, um, to establish the Sanhedrin specifically. Yeah, it's also to give the uh, stick, you know, to the next generation. It's also the stick to the generation because, uh, you know, we had in the last years, we had a lot of very old, respected uh, rabbis, you know, over the years of 90, you know, they passed away. Adin, uh, uh, Rabbi Steinsalz passed away, so uh, he's not in the picture anymore. And I think um, I think also the, um, the sages were talking, okay, there will be a time, you know, when all the sages are actually dying out, the short before Moshiach comes. You know, and I see this one, it's, uh, you know, because of the Adam, you know, lust and the hookers on the side and so on. Nobody from the young generation is really interested in Torah and so on. Um, so that, you know, the, the, uh, you know the, the next generation is completely off from Torah. And I see now that, um, well, there are not many, many scholars left when I take a look around. You know, and I think it was very important, and I was uh, absolutely super happy. You know, when you explained this, and when you said this already, you know, a hundred percent. So, so on Sunday we met Rabbi Tzvi Idan, and on Monday I was just uploading the video, trying to take it easy, and then I see that the left is being extremely disrespectful. They're going in the Knesset. Being extremely disrespectful to the uh, Yitzchak Kreiser, which is really a sweet person. He, he, you know, doesn't can't hurt anybody, and he doesn't scream and shout. He doesn't have that. Yeah, he's also young, aggressive right? uh, nature, also young, and they're just. He doesn't have this aggressive nature, and they're just you know, being extremely disrespectful and uh, screaming and shouting and not letting him conduct the veida. And I said, the situation is too hot in Israel. We need to go there right now and set the stand once and for all to make some clarity and say that the Sanhedrin needs to go forward. So on Tuesday, I go to the Knesset. And I was there early and we prayed. And after we prayed, we sat with Professor Abraham Ehrlich, and eventually we got in. And again, I see the whole circus again. The left 
are being disrespectful. They're not participating. They're not even trying to, you know, understand what's happening. They're just protesting. That's it. Yes. So right. when the uh, lawyer is, is explaining the actual law, and this is a global, uh, yeah. uh, this is a global phenomena, a global phenomena that the left actually, you know, uh, doesn't submit to anything. As soon as they lose, the only thing what they can do is attack, protest, you know, peacefully uh, protest by burning down whole cities and so on. I mean, it's uh, terrible. Yeah. There are huge mass demonstrations now. You know, it was so, reported. Yeah. You know, that they even attacked more or less, you know, his uh, baby's wife. A hundred percent. And that's a very, also very low blow. Why are you going after the prime minister's wife? That's very disgraceful. But let's go back to the Knesset. So I'm sitting there and these left are wasting their time. They're not, they're, they don't even care about the people that came to talk. Not just me. I, I, they see me, they know that I'm a right wing, I'm from the Karedi, I'm religious, but there were other people there that came to talk that are from the left, that came to actually help them with their protest. And even to them, they didn't let them talk. In other words, they were so busy wasting everybody's time that even the people from their own party, from their own side, yeah. they didn't let them talk. So uh, we ended up waiting. Imagine I came there. Uh, the, the Vida was opened about a one o'clock. They had a break and then they continued after that. I was able to speak about 9 p.m. or 8.45, something like that. So I was there the whole day the just in order to speak at night. Yeah. So that was very, very, it's, it's uh, you know, it's unprofessional. And uh, Sim Kharatman tried his best. He's a very, very brilliant man. Most of the left over there when there's when when the lawyer is explaining the law they're not listening and then when the lawyer finishes talking and they say okay now it's time for the opposition to ask questions they don't know what to ask because they weren't listening they don't understand how the law works so they say um we have a question is this law racist against minorities so the lawyer starts to explain them how the law works and again, they can't understand it because they're not listening. So they say, we just want to know, yes or no, is it against minorities? So he says, no, it's not against minorities. So they say, yes, it is. Busha, busha. And then they get the... <laughs> So even if he says it's not against minorities, they don't understand. They don't care to understand. They don't let them talk. And they just make a protest. And then when the when they realize that that Sim Kharatman wants to keep going in the discussion, they say, "Wait a minute! Our, according to the law, we have a right to to answer you now." So he says, "Okay," and there's no time limit. So he says, "Okay," and then they just go, "It's very sad that we have to be here and nobody's listening to us, and we know that you're not going to listen to us, and you're going to pass the law in anyway. So we're we're going to talk about how uh, you know," and they just fill in the words just to waste everybody's time so everybody's wasting time because these guys don't care they don't care and no, it was very very opposition to go this is the that. opposition you know yes. this is the opposition and it's a revolution the left are the revolutionaries they do not accept any, any anything anything so continue so, oh, here is me yes ah. so here is me in the Knesset. I took a few minutes. You see, I was there first. This is after the break. We came back. This is me sitting there uh, with the with the chitas, you know, studying a little bit between all the uh, shots fired, you know. And uh, but I think that when I, I was there, at least, even though they don't let people talk, if you're not a, a Knesset member already, but every time the leftists were just trying to antagonize on purpose. I think the fact that I was there and I was able to like go, oh my God, like again, like just the facial, facial expressions that we were giving all the the common sense people, you know, even though, again, again, the leftists, they also had to wait till very late at night just to get their point across. So just the facial expressions of the people that were there, I think also gave Sim Kharotman the courage to throw them out because really at a certain point, they're not allowed to disturb the process. Even if they have the right to talk, 
they're not allowed to disturb the process. So Simcha Rotman was very, very frustrated. You know, he's taking time to let the opposition give, you know, their position, maybe change the law. He's ready to change the law, but they don't even understand the law. So, but because he saw that I, me and the reg the normal people, including Professor Avram Ehrlich, and there was another lady, gentleman, uh, general lady next to me that she uh, uh, studies law and she was also, she's not affiliated, it's the first time I met her, but she was just as upset as me. She prepared, you know, a bunch of papers that she was gonna read all the papers yeah. that she prepared and she couldn't talk because these guys are wasting the time. So you have very highly educated citizens from all over Israel that come to speak, to talk to the, to the you know, give their advice. You know, they're not getting paid, I'm not getting paid. This lady that learned to, about law for her whole life is not getting paid. Yes. No, it's out of um, sincere interest. Absolutely. No, where are you? Okay. So you have brilliant people from Israel, from all over that came to speak. They just want to talk for five minutes, maybe 20 minutes, half hour. And that's it. Just say their point. And, and, and they trust the government to take their information and deal with it however they feel fit. But because the left is just busy railroading the process, they're not letting the, the, the procedure go through. Uh, um, it's just very, very frustrating. It's very, very sad. And, and, and they talk about the end of the democracy when everybody knows that the right, right wing are in power right now because of the democratic system. Yes, and they because of the democratic process. Absolutely. Exactly. So let them, you know, that's what they got. That's what they got chosen to do. They got chosen to get to work and to change the system. There's a reason why there's elections. It's because people are not satisfied with the way the system was before. These people are the will of the of the people. So that if if you want to know what the end of democracy is, if the right wing doesn't do everything it's trying to do right now, then you know that it's the end of democracy in Israel. Because, because these because left everybody's are, doing are the, the minority. Story. Well, I don't uh, um you know, I don't like the democratic process at all because uh, it's always lives by compromise, meaning it is always a lie. Nevertheless, it is very, um, you know, obvious that every time any right wing government comes, when then you have some type of law and order, every time a left wing government comes in, well, then you have um, utopian transformation of the society with pet projects, climate change, LGBT agenda and a transfer of wealth out of your pocket, you know, incredible corruption, unbelievable corruption, you know, uh, this is what I see with the left. And um, currently I see that they are afraid to lose their, their pots, you know, their um, public pots for their pet project. When they see they lost the election, now, you know, uh, somebody is going after corruption, after crime, after really bad people, well, then there would be a lot of lefties, you know, they were just taken out because they're criminal. Because they do not stick with the Torah, they do not value human life, they don't value the neighbor, they don't do, they, it's, they don't, they're only interested in power and money. Unfortunately, I have to say that. And I think that, um, you know, now in the in the process of the Geula, in the reawakening to Torah and so on and so on, you know, the left is finally finding out that too many people woke up to the reality. And uh, you cannot stop what, uh, you know, the pro progress of people finding out what they all did in the past and how they basically screw us over again and again. And not only in Israel, in Germany, in America and all the other liberal democracies, you know, it's so uh, I wanted to say that the, my video already has about 13,000 views. Yes. On Twitter alone. And uh, for comparison, just, uh, let's please take a look at this and then you can translate it for everybody, you know? Yes. Yes. Let's do to, that. Uh, you can uh, screen. Re uh, can you uh, do the screen? Um, let me just uh, screen share. Uh, I'd rather if you do it, if you want. It's on the website. I put it on MN Global on ah, the okay. front page as well, if you want.
Oh, super good, MN Global. So we can immediately do some advertising here <laughs> for MN Global. <laughs> and of course, you know, for uh, so we uh, I open here some other pages here. So while we are at it, so. So you can go on the off on the fundraising tab, yeah. Yes. We have it on the homepage as well, but you can go on the fundraising tab. Okay. So this here are all the, the advisors. Page. So this is the front page, um, in the fundraiser section. You said now where do we have Sunny fundraiser? Yeah. Ah, here scouting mission. Oh. Scroll down. Yep. Right. Okay. Dupa -dupa. So this was day two, three. So we already uh, we already went a far way, actually. Then, of course, of course, we have here our half shekel. Of course, very important. You no know, people should participate in our shekel. So day four, five, yes. seven. Here, okay. Uh, yes. So here you see. Kola uh, Olam. Yeah. Rova Olam. Verov. האחרונות הראו שהם מעוניינים ב... לא רק לשים את היד על התנ״ך ולהישבע, אלא גם מה כתוב בתנ״ך, מה... וה... ויש פה את הביטוי, מה שהמחוקק כתב, איך קוראים לזה? אוקיי, אז אתה קומפוזל או? לשון המחוקק. Yes. So I pick up the chitas, the book, the, the, the Torah, and I put my hand on it and I say that most people throughout the world, they don't just want to swear on the Bible, you know, law enforcement, judges, you know, government officials, they take the oath, they swear on the Bible. But most people in the world today want to open the Bible. They want to understand what the Bible is saying. Yes. And I say that in Israel, there's the language of the, it says, in the in the language of the mechokek, in the language of the the scribe oh, of yeah. the constitution, yeah. yeah. But the problem is, is that that Israel doesn't have a chuka. There's a, a vacant space, a void, in the constitution for a chuka, for a system of law. That void has never been filled. In other words, everything about the Israeli law right now. It's just a bunch of temporary, illegitimate law, yes. according to the founding documents of the Constitution of Israel. So I explained to the people there that the Knesset... Okay, you can press play, I'll explain. Yes. כפי שעם ישראל סוחב את זה ומוסר נפש ומיליונים מאיתנו מתו על חידוש השם בשביל זה ואהבות אבות. אוקיי, פוז, פוז. So I say over there that the chuka needs to be filled in by the Sanhedrin body and it has to be the written and oral tradition of the Torah and this is the Torah that millions and millions of Jews for thousands of years have died to sanctify Hashem's name in order for us to have that right now. And our forefathers are looking from heaven at us and saying, you have everything you need. You have a majority ortho uh, Orthodox Jewish right wing in Israel, millions of Jews in Israel. What else do you need? Let's go. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. דתי, והציונות הדתית הצטרפה לשעס וגימל שכמובן שומרת על המצוות ואנחנו לא יכולים בתור עדה של רוב במדינת ישראל לקיים יותר מפז מצוות שזה המצוות שהצטווינו בגלות אנחנו לא יכולים לעבור לתרי"ג מצוות שזה הפוטנציאל המלא הרוחני והגשמי של עם ישראל אוקיי, פוז, 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 As, as, a, as a religious majority in Israel, we cannot fulfill our rights to do all the, the 613 commandments of the Torah. 
we can only do 87, which is the temporary amount during the time of exile. So I say that, okay, uh, keep going, I'm sorry. Yes, no, no, Sanhedrin. Minui Melech, Mechiat Amalek, Bebinyan Bet Abkhira. Ve'ani lo omer et ze... Yeah, so basically you said, yes, we need uh, um, to put in the laws, yes. the Sanhedrin, exactly. the king, the kingdom. Exactly. Exactly. So I say the four things that we need to do. And I say that the, that without those things, a Jew does not have his religious freedom in the land of Israel. Yes. And Ephraim neither. Farut im Amarek. Yes, exactly. Ela ke bitui ruhani la am Israel, when you're telling me that the Navi Arishon, the Geula, was not a Jew. It was a Bilam who said, who said to the people who paid money to get rid of the Am Israel, he said to them, listen, friends, everything that the Lord will do with me is what I will say. And then he will be able to get rid of the Am Israel. And he was a man who was the best of them, but how do we know? We know that... Okay, to cut the point. The point is like this. נכון להיום ונכון לעכשיו, מדינת ישראל עוברת את התהליך הזה של מה אנחנו עושים, מה המילה האחרונה, ולהראות לכל העולם שאנחנו יכולים להיות אור לגויים, ולהתחיל לדבר על הנושא המרכזי שזה תורת השם. So I say that the whole world right now, so I, I mentioned Bilam the prophet, which was not Jewish, and he's the first prophet that speaks about the Geula. So I say, and he was paid to curse the Jewish people, and he told the people, I cannot curse the Jewish people. Whatever Hashem decides to put in my mouth, that's what I'm going to say. And, yes. and then he asked me, okay, come on, hurry up and tell us what the point is. The point is, I told them to focus on the Torah and to look at the Torah and take it seriously. And, you know, that's, that's basically that. So I would just, if we're already here, we, we get the, the bonuses for the, for the friends of the crew. For the Effie Nation. So you have the pictures of me. Yes. You scroll down a bit. Yeah. The pictures of me here at the Knesset. And also I prayed at the Knesset earlier. The Effies, of course. And this is two extra videos as well. The video on the way. And the video with me, yes, Professor we Abram Perlis. We had a few minutes. Our fundraiser, you know, it was uh, very nice. You know, we... Um... We also, in the meantime, started to uh, change a bit our website. We put this directly here on top. You know, New Deal becoming real, Sun Henry Initiative. So we put the fundraiser directly here on, on top. So, wow, halfway, nearly halfway through. Yeah, it's a uh, four and a half. So it's really that, uh, you know, so we put here our pictures, you know, um, here with David. And, you know, David uh, called me this morning and he said, you know, he's now um, able to completely better describe also to his business communities and to his city and so on why it's important that we support the Jewish people to build up the Sanhedrin. We said we are in a situation where it's absolutely necessary, necessary to find a clearance on certain issues and we, you know, standing completely behind it. So all the um, guys who, you know, uh, Noahites, ultra-Orthodox Noahites, uh, Ephraimites, guys who think they're from Joseph and so on and so on, they should come, please, you know, to Zion5777.com, you know, and join our cooperation. So from the non-Jewish side, you know, we never at no point said we're Jewish. We said we're the nation of Ephraim. So, but we, um, you know, cooperate with the Jewish people to bring the kingdom back to Israel. That's it. You know, reestablish establish and so on. So, and of course, um, okay, I have to still make this a bit nice, you know, on our Torah club, of course, you know, we have here our all, um, all our video, all our videos in raw, uncut, uncensored. You know, we have to see that uh, one of the last, um, I think, um, I think video number 16 or so, we, we were talking about an issue about health. <laughs> and it was, you know, it was uh, basically, again, you know, um, canceled from YouTube. They uh, censored us for using too truthful language concerning various people. So it's very, you know, everybody who wants to support us, you know, go to torahclub.com. 
uh, pay your 70 bucks and then you become part of a community where we actually really discuss all these issues, including the fundraiser initiative. So um, I think we went uh, an awesome way. Uh, uh, Joseph, you know, it's, um, it's quite awesome. Yeah, it's quite awesome what happens. Because, um, of course, at the very same time, you know, at, at the very same time, you were in the um, in the Knesset speaking at the Knesset. Okay, let, let me. You know, I'm starting to prepare something in German. You know, I put this uh, shortly up. Uh, write a little about the German stuff here. Um, so, at the very moment you were speaking at the Knesset, you know, so Eli Cohen went to Berlin and met. First, Annalena Baerbock, you know, our uh, left communist green um, George Soros puppet in uh, Germany. She's a foreign minister. And then he went, you know, uh, to the memorial, Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, and um, here with Chabad Rabbi Yehuda Teichtal. So this is the very same place where I started, you know, 2015, uh, 2015 Ephraim. And they said, okay, our constitution, my terms of service as the Torah and the prophet, and I want to work this out with the Jewish people. You know, the first guy I visited was Yehuda Teichtal in Berlin, 2015. You know? So, and I thought, wow, this is quite something that, you know, the, the whole issue with Germany, um, uh, Germany and Israel, Christian and Jews, um, and left and right, you know, this is, we, it's only solvable when we have a Sanhedrin. It's only solvable when we have a Sanhedrin. 100%. Yeah. Because the, uh, you have no idea how many Germans are currently completely, totally, utterly confused. They don't understand what's happening. You know, a lot of Americans, they don't understand what's happening because, um, you know, while there are only a few faithful in the various countries, you know, I mean, I, I visited Zagreb, you know, um, here Rabbi Zaklas. I mean, you said there are 3000 Jewish uh, people here some, somewhere around in, uh, in all of Croatia. So very, very small number. Um, so there are only a few guys everywhere, but the left is global and they have a, a, a joint agenda. So the left in America is the same and connected with the left in, a, in, uh, in Israel and with the left in Germany. And Germany ha has a very prominent role due to our history, you know. And I think now is really the time, you know, to, uh, to, to, to really... Bring this up, you know, I brought this also up to our government because the, uh, you know, our government, they say officially they're obliged, you know, they have a, the reason for their state is Israel. You know, so Israel is one of the main focus points of the Federal Republic of Germany. Okay, but it's only, say, only, I want to show only you, uh, this, this week's magazine, if I can, well, one second. This is the Rebbe yes. receiving the tambourine from one of the women, and it has the words Yechi, you know, Yechi Adonenu Moreno Barabinu Melech Hamashiach Long, long live the King Mashiach, basically. And this was during Tavshin and Aleph, around the year that I was born, um, when the Rebbe was going, you know, very, very, a lot of uh, encouragement about Mashiach. So. They have the, the verses here that the Jews said during uh, sing to Hashem, a new song, sing to Hashem for the miracles. This is what the Jews, the, uh, Miriam, the daughter of Moses, yes. was with the tambourine when they were leaving Egypt. So in Judaism, the women don't sing, but they were able to play with the tambourine and join the men in, sing, in song uh, as they were leaving Egypt. So why, why um, I think that's Today, the drums of Mashiach, you know, are something that we need to start to beat. You know, we need to start to understand that we need to completely embody and understand that we have to go full forward. I explained this to my friends. I said, you don't need to wait for a sign from Hashem, like a cow going through your kitchen window 
in order to start keeping kosher. So the same thing, you don't need to wait for a sign to put the Sanhedrin together. It's a mitzvah, it's a commandment in yes. the Torah that we need to just fulfill. Some people are just waiting for something to happen. The only thing we're waiting for and the only thing that we're praying for is that after we make the Sanhedrin and after we a chronic king and we eradicate Amalek and we build a temple, we want Hashem to be revealed in this world. In other words, the part that we're, that, that's not up to us is that Hashem should be revealed in this world. But if it's something that's a mitzvah, that's a commandment, that it's a law of the Torah, like the Rambam says, the Rambam's book is a, a book of laws. It's not a book of, you know, stories. It's a book of laws. So yeah. if there's something that's a law, we need to find out how to do it. And, and if the Rambam says that when you go into Israel, you need to do these things, so then we need to just do it. It's not something that we need to be too emotional about or to wait for a sign. The only thing we need to wait for is that if we build a temple and we have the Sanhedrin and we have a king and we destroy Amalek, what's Amalek? That we don't have to deal with the terrorist attacks like we're dealing yes. this month. Unfortunately, many Jews were killed and it's, and it's a very, very painful thing. And the Arabs are upset because they burnt a few stolen cars. All those cars were probably stolen from Jewish people anyway. Well, let's not get into that right now. The point is that the Arabs are like, oh, look, the Jews are, they burnt a few of our cars. Yeah, you killed a few of our brothers and sisters. So and it's a horrible way, you know, this, is, this is the usual, this is the usual stuff of the left. The left is burning normally cars. In Berlin, I think every day, there was a year, every day in Berlin, the cars are burning. Because of the less they are putting this, and nobody is, you know, complaining. Oh, rampage! This, this, this. Berlin under fire and a terror attack. <laughs> On the so, left, do it. It's kosher, of course. Yeah. Um, here concerning um, concerning with the mitzvot. Um, I mean, I told you also, you know, that when I came to Jerusalem, you know, as a you know as a German and so on, coming out of a Christian house and so on. You know, when I started the way, uh, you know, of Torah, you know, it, um, you know, it became sports for me. Okay, what, <laughs> what hasn't been done? Who did it? Who didn't do it? Because I knew, okay, I'm, you know, very early in Jerusalem, you know, things happen. Pope stopped by like years ago and so on. So there were very historic uh, things happening already during the time I was there. So it became sports. We said, okay, what can I do? what nobody else did or which mitzvot, you know, can you fulfill, for example, with our temple coins, you know, where, where we said, uh, where we give now the opportunity to people said, okay, listen, you want to fulfill the uh, commandment of the Chetzi Shekel. So you want to send your tax. So here, here's the coin. So this is basically, you know, the sports. Now, my, all the Christian friends, they didn't dig this. And here we are now in the very big issue where I ran into now since the day I started that while we are innerly driven, you know, we are part of the new covenant because Hashem put his Torah in our hearts. So it's an our inner drive that we have to do this. Okay. Now, there you have this huge opposition from the political side. They said, no, 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 listen, you have to keep our laws. You have to listen to our judges. You have to listen to our police. You have to listen. So wait a second, wait a second, you know. So we come with the things from the left. Now, the, from the Christian side, it says, no, no, no. Jesus finished the Torah. And in the moment you want to work out, you know, work out your um, salvation with, you know, keeping the Torah, you know, you're basically denying Jesus and so on and so on. So they are currently extremely afraid because they also see what's happening, that when we are successful in building the Sanhedrin at the temple, well, then the Antichrist comes. And they said, listen, guys, the Antichrist already has been there. It's Pope Francis. He's running around. He did all his spiel. It's all over, you know. But as long as nobody is explaining this to them, well, they are still in this, no, this is our belief, we believe this, and you cannot convince us otherwise, unless you show us the Antichrist, you know, that's all called. So you know, 
the, the Christian when it comes is a to dead the end. Moshiach, uh, when it yeah. comes to the Moshiach issue, then we are in the center of the hardcore issue. Okay, guys, Jesus is not coming anymore. You know, and that's so to the, explain to a Christian, he freaks out. He said, what you mean he's not coming? Man, guy, he's dead, please. You know, don't. And this is me saying as a Christian, you know, this was the biggest is, hey, Jesus is not coming anymore. 100%. So, oh, the Christianity is a dead end. And we spoke about this. And we just mentioned it quickly that it's a hindrance for the truth seeker, the 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 whole Christianity thing. But I wanted to say, you you, you said a word, spiel, which it's also a word in Yiddish, so I have a I have a good joke for you today. Uh, it's not about Germans. <laughs> it's a regular, it's a regular uh, joke. Um, uh, listen, I know that Christianity as a whole, okay, is a dead end. Why? Because the Pope he represents Christianity, but in the meantime, there are, I think, in the USA alone, forty thousand denominations which says, "Yes, we are Christian. We believe in this, but we have nothing to do with the Catholic Church. Nothing." Okay. So for centuries, the only thing the Jewish people knew was the Roman Catholic Church. So there was no Christianity. Was Adam? You didn't want to have to deal with this. But today, there are guys like us who says, okay, you grow up in a Christian household. You, somebody gives you a hands over a thick book, you know, 2,000 pages. Three, two, and I thought, says, it's all about Jesus. So what the fuck? Okay, so you, so you leave everything. And then, of course, you know, you start, you go into the land and you start reading in the front. And you say, wait a second, it's not about Jesus. It's about Israel. It's everything about Israel. It's about the covenant Hashem made with, God, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he takes her care, he himself takes care of his descendants. So, Ulf, really, it's interesting what you're saying, because what happens is that today you have, and for the last couple of hundred years, really, you have these branches of Christianity branching off, and each of them is basically saying a small issue with the narrative of the Christianity. So some of them realize that Sunday is not Shabbat. So they call themselves the Seventh day Adventist. And then you have the guys who translated the, 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 the Bible so that they can actually study it. So that's another group. And then there was a big fight about that. And every couple hundred years, you have another group that's branching off. Slowly, 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 they're actually leaving the shell, or it's like the snake going out of his old yeah. body. And basically becoming Noahides, hopefully, you know, making their way slowly back to the truth of the Torah, you know, not to compare all the Christians like a snake, but I'm just saying, <laughs> you get what I'm saying. That's the example. Yeah, these, these branches of, I mean, this is, please, you know, this is exactly what the whole issue about Yehoshua was, that Yehoshua should not depart from the law, neither to the left nor to the right. And this is why I like, especially Itamar ben Gwir, because yes, I walk in the footsteps of Yehoshua. Yeah, super. So, so. By the way, Ulf, today, this week, I'm, I'm making so a the, challenge. When you, when you depart from the left, you know, these are all the Christian guys. You know, I'm telling you, this is the breeding ground. I mean, when, when you tell a Christian, okay, listen, let's go together to the, with the New Testament. And he reads this with, with open eyes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, even Adam um, Eliyahu Berkowitz now recently said, "Yeah, it's when you see it's a Jewish book." Yes, because it's about a Jewish guy. He keeps the Torah. He's discussing with the Pharisees. He's with the Sadducees. You get a pretty good overview of what happened two thousand years ago. You know, and um, so it's first of all a story about a Jewish guy. So, and it's, uh, this is what, something I never, ever understood. So that Jewish guy told his disciples, keep the Torah. So this is why I now I grabbed this. I said, what, what's, uh, you know, when I came to Jerusalem, it was the first thing I said, well, I don't get this. The guy says, you have to keep the Torah. So I keep the Torah. So everybody cursed me for this, you know. And then I found out that, uh, you know, the Jewish people had nothing to do with Jesus. And I, I said, why? I don't get this. Why didn't they embrace the story? And explain the Christians how what Jesus really meant, you know. So then I found out because of this two thousand year old issue between Rome and the Jewish people, you know. So this is still open. Exactly, exactly. one hundred percent open. I wanted to say the joke was that I was making a chunt, a challenge for oh, Shabbat oh, this week nice. in our synagogue. <laughs> yeah. So. 
um, anyway, so what I was, uh, so I was thinking about it because this is going to be the first time that in my shul I can eat the challenge if it's fleshic, if it's uh, you know, meat, because. Um, I'm the I'm one of the only Chabadniks over there, and Chabadniks don't eat anybody's, uh, you know, don't trust anybody with their meat, only from Chabad Shochet, uh, Chabad slaughter. So, <laughs> so, um, so today I was saying, you know, if you're frying the onions and you're frying the meat a little bit to give it flavor before you put it in the challenge, if it's a regular meat. Regular kosher meat, you just need a non-stick pan. But if it's Chabad meat, it has to be a non-stick pan. You know, no <laughs> stick is. <laughs> like no kunst, no <laughs> non-stick pan. So, uh, so it's going to be a non-stick challenge. Uh, it's going to be a Chabad challenge. And what's good about it is that this time, if I make the challenge, everybody can eat. And now you might ask me, oh, why is Yossi Edry, one day he's at the Knesset, the next day he's making a challenge for his community, right? That might be, that's a good question. And the answer is that it's like when you're, when you're going to, uh, you're teaching a class, right? And they're on a certain level, you have to reach them on that level. So in my shul, if you donate a, a challenge, they they let you say a Dvar Torah. That's like the currency. <laughs> they let you speak a few words of Torah if you donate a chillin. So it's it's a very it is what it is. I'm working within the rules, you know. <laughs> so so if it if if what if they need a chillin, we'll make them a chillin, and then we'll speak about the Sanhedrin and we'll speak about good things. So uh, you know, and I heard you you also send the the, the chocolate balls to your people as well. So yes. even if they don't understand everything, they can taste uh, the, the... Yes, the, the... absolutely. We call them energy. And they are super bio sun-dried fig tree energy balls. You know, um, I really want to... Uh, they, I call them Effie power balls, you know. When you eat one of these uh, balls, it's like, you know, you have a whole meal. You have a whole meal. <laughs> there is a saying in Germany, you know, love goes through the stomach. <laughs> Love goes through the stomach and, you know, it's uh, when you bring food, you know, and you can sit down with people, it's uh, the best thing ever. But, Ulf, you know, even Alex Jones, when he sells vitamins, he puts a star and he says, you know, don't, you know, if you take my supplements, don't jump out the window and expect to fly, you know. <laughs> hey, wait a second, when you take the, uh, ah, wait a second, <laughs> I still have them here, look at this. You know, these are the power balls. Oh, nice, nice. Oh, yeah, these that. are power balls. You know, they are like, made out of uh, sun-dried fi uh, fix. you know, here, absolutely bio. I personally, um, um, you know... Personally, squeeze them. <laughs> yeah, no, I personally harvested them and then put, like, all kinds of uh, other bio stuff in there, you know. It's, Freshly uh, squeezed balls by, oh, <laughs> <laughs> sun-dried. <laughs> Come, come on. Okay, okay, you're solid. Okay, so did uh, was it tasty? Was it good? Was it good? Yes. Yeah, it's it's ready to go. Take, do you take mom's recipe or do you uh, you know take a, a quick fix? You know, like a solid five minutes you know, where you just throw in the stuff and then put. No, it no, no. In. So I'll tell you. So for those who want to know how to make a proper challenge, let's go. You want to know? Let's go. So first of all, I turned up the heat with my best uh pot in the house which is a ceramic ceramic pot yes okay it goes like it's like in the shape of a wok and it's a ceramic it costs like i don't know a lot of money i got it as a gift from uh, my brother and uh i put some oil in there and i started to fry onions so tip number one in a kitchen if you want to give a good smell and you want to get going fry some onions you know so we chops Absolutely. up some onions and with a lot and, of uh, garlic yeah. lots of garlic yeah, so I I trapped up some onions. I threw, threw in some salt, pepper, nothing crazy, and then I took the. So for a challenge, usually you have like a big piece of meat, but I I have some ground beef, so I said I'm gonna make a special mix out of that, and just use that. So I mixed. Uh, I put some eggs in the ground beef. I put some salt, pepper, garlic powder. Um, I think that's it. You know, and then I and then uh, breadcrumbs, and I made like these, like like Meatball. patties out of the meat. Yeah, pretty much. I took the, I took the onions out after like twenty minutes, a half hour, and then I put the meat in, and I and I fried the meat, 
both sides, like a, kind of like a hamburger. And then I put them aside as well. And then I put in the same pot. I put in all the potatoes. So like, I don't know, a bunch of like eight potatoes with water and let it boil the potatoes in another pot. So at the end, the child's going to be in one pot, but this is like, like a DJ, yeah. In another part, oh, so, so I put... you do it simply. Okay, 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 okay. So, so you are onions, sweet potatoes, um, potatoes. Um, so like uh, and beans, of course. And that's in another pot with water. Let it boil. Lentil. And then eventually, slowly, we put everything back in with some paprika, some cumin, and then in the in the in the dirty pot from before, the dirty, not dirty pot. We put the. Uh, Jachnun. Ulf. If you're making a challenge, you need jachnun. You know what jachnun is? Jachnun is like a rolled up dough, like a, a tema, Yemenite temani rolled up dough. And when you and so I put that in with water and just cooked it with a little bit of the from the water from the challenge. So with all the spices and everything, you have this rolled up dough and it expands. It's like a kishke. It's kind of like anyway. So a lot going like a on. Knedelet. Like a knedel. Huh? Like a knedel. Like a knedel, kind of, yeah, like, like knedel, yeah. yeah, kind of like. <laughs> so that's how I made the challenge. I'll send you pictures. Very, very later. good. So um, we want to see. So we do some cooking competitions, definitely. I love to cook. I love to cook. You know, I uh, cook for hundreds of people. You know, you know I, cooking Cooking is also what we do because cooking, you're, you're dealing with raw ingredients. You're dealing with natural things. You're dealing with dangerous tools like a knife. And you have to be very precise. And it's very important to get the right mix. So yeah. people like me and you that have big communities that rely on us for a few, you know, insight. It's really like understanding what ingredients you're working with, knowing how to mix it good yes. in a way that the product should be correct. So what we're doing with the Sanhedrin, with getting the advisors together, getting the judges together, you know, deciding what we're putting into the mix, what we're not using, what we are using to get what's that cooking? perfect. What's cooking? What's cooking? Exactly. What's cooking? <laughs> what's cooking? Can, you, can you already? So if you want to know if someone's a leader, check him out in the kitchen. If he can cook, he probably knows how to lead, you know? <laughs> so uh, that's what I can yeah, say. You know, I think, you know, um, you know, for our Torah club, and I think, you know, this is... Um, so currently, of course, we, we talked a lot about, you know... Um, over the last, uh, you know, um, series and video calls we made, we, we talked about a lot of, you know, political stuff, a lot of, you know, hardcore Torah issues, spiritual issues, and so on. But in a way, you know, I think, you know, what I envisioned one day, you know, to have a community who are actually also talking about cooking recipes, you know, how to make the best uh, kosher, um, you know, <laughs> the best kosher shawl and so on and so on, you know. Exchange, and I'm well, still perhaps on the perhaps on the uh, Kajabi community we could make a, a challenge like uh, your mother's knedlach or something. <laughs> yeah, something like this, you know, how you're, uh, you know, uh, do. I'm still looking for the best hummus, uh, um, hummus <laughs> recipe and so on. <laughs> so yeah, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. oh, that would be. I mean, I think that's pretty cool. We could try to do some cooking recipe yes, competition because. Uh, because you have kids, oh, you, you, you yeah. have kids. Uh, we all have kids. We all have kids. So you you come home and so on. And uh, for for me, you know, it was for Friday, Friday Shabbat. Uh, I went shopping, you know, Rami Levy and so on, getting the two jellets, and then started cooking. I said this was something. I said, okay, when somebody on Shabbat is cooking, then it's me. You know, this is the <laughs> yeah. So this was my f favorite day of the day. And I think, you know, the whole um, issue with, um, you know, fast food and the family issues around all the community issues are surrounding around food. I mean, this is what Abraham in his tent, you know, and Sarah, okay, go out, make some, hey, cook some chicken, uh, cook some uh, lamb in the milk of the month. No, I, so he told <laughs> <him> what, <laughs> You know, he brings it, you know, some barbecued uh, stuff. Go make know. some cakes. Yeah, go make go make some matzos. Yeah, absolutely. So so food and eating, you know, it's uh, it's a big issue in the community. You know, of course. The unifier, when, uh, yes. Yeah, and especially for those people who are coming out, you know, starting now the uh, Torah lifestyle and they want to eat kosher and so on. 
I mean, they don't know. They, uh, you know, it's uh, what is allowed? How do I cook? What do I do? And so on. You know, how do I celebrate Shabbat? You know, how make, do I make it a real uh, event? You know, candle lighting, nice, uh, you know, the Kiddush and so on. And it surrounds oh, all. I want to say, I want to say, for example, there's this lady that moved into Katsurin and she says she, she doesn't know anybody here. She bought a house and she wants to make the Hanukkah Tabayit, which is like a special uh, ceremony to thank Hashem for the new house. Yes. So she said, I don't know how to do it and I don't have any friends here. So I see you two rabbis today. We were sitting at the mall with Rabbi Chayak. Maybe you guys can help me. So I said to her that the American group that I'm part of here in Katsrin, we get together every Thursday night anyway. Maybe we can do it at your place. And we will do a siyum asechet, which is we have a rabbi, Rabbi Buki, which is also one of the dayanim on the justice board of the Sanhedrin, the Shoftim. So... He finished uh, uh, a part of the Gemara, a full book of the Gemara, and he has to make a seum, which means a celebration of finishing the Torah. So he's going to speak about the, the Talmud. He's going to teach us a little bit about what he's, what he's been studying. And then there's a special prayer that's done for someone who finishes a full book of the Talmud. So I said, perhaps we can get him to come and, and, and do the seum over there. So that would be the Torah study. And then we will have a prayer, evening prayer, Ma'ariv. That would be prayer. And uh, charity, I guess. We can raise some charity for somebody who needs or whatever. And then we have the three main pillars. And then uh, everyone's sitting around eating kosher food, play, saying blessings on the water, on, on the stuff. That's basically what it is, to bring blessing to the house. It's no very strong... Um, it's not a very specific... It's not like getting married or, you know... it's. A, yeah. It's kind of a celebration of good energy and to do as many mitzvahs as possible during this time with, you know, in order to give blessing to that house. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. But again, like you said, she's not religious. She doesn't know what to do. She's like, do I have to pay you for this? I'm like, we don't charge. It's like, it's fine. We're the community. You know, you don't have to pay us. You know, you know yeah. it's, it's irrelevant, you know, but we're going to try to help her for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I you're think, right. We need to try to focus the people that want to get into this head of how to cook kosher food. What do you do? How, if you want to divide your kitchen between milk and meats, what's a what's a good idea to start? You know, how do you divide it? What are you going to do? So you have to get, let's say, blue blue cutlery for the for the. You have to make a different different kind of cutlery. You got a blue stuff for the milchiks for the you know chalavi, and then you have for the milk. And stuff the, the and stuff. the dairy, and yeah. then you have red stuff for the for the meat. That's in general, and in general, you should have a set of cutlery for Shabbat, a set of cutlery for the breakfast, you know, that kind of stuff in the morning. And you have a separate drawer, separate cutlery for dinner and for Shabbat, you know, that you use for when you're eating meat. So you have separate drawers for the spoons and forks, separate drawers for the for both of them, double sets. And the same thing is with the plates and with the bowls. You just have separate situations. And then uh, if you have two sinks in your house, so then you just make one sink for washing the dishes for the chalavi, and you make another sink for the bisari. If you have one sink, so then you never put the, the dishes in the sink. You just kind of wash them over, and you decide half this counter is going to be yes, for yes, putting yes. down dairy, half is going to be for meat, and you don't put down anything that's hot, on the especially if it's hot um, on the milk you put you don't put it on that side or that side cold is not such an issue you know if you have a, a, buy, a bottle of milk but yeah definitely we should try to create some kind of challenges and in that fun way there's no reason why torah should you, be a pain um, i mean you are thinking of yeah. course you know first immediately in a kosher kitchen you know separating and so on and so on you know uh, for a lot of people it's like okay uh, what you know what sausage is even kosher you know i mean uh, you know uh, yeah, it, it will be the meat uh, when will the pig be kosher you know, <laughs> you know Do they I mean, come out with technology to make pigs kosher yet but you know the answer is of that Hashem made the world in, in a way that all the non-kosher food that you might want, there's a kosher substitute. So there's yeah. there's actually a fish in the ocean that tastes like pork 
that's kosher. Um, the reason why the Jews don't go specifically to go find out what fish that is, even though the Gemara tells us which fish it is, is because we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're fine, you know, not eating pig. It's not such a big deal. We'll survive, you know. Yeah, yeah. But for those who, who have like uh, withdrawal symptoms for, for eating non-kosher food, they should try to find, um, you know, there's a lot of alternative stuff today online. Anyway, you have tofu. You could probably make it into anything you want. So, I mean, you have different ideas that, you know, but you be, you need to be committed first and you have to decide yes, that this absolutely. is the step you want to take. Absolutely. Absolutely, and, and then uh, everything after that becomes easy. And of course, we're we're here. Anybody that want to talk to us about these things, if you need advice on how to make your kitchen kosher, just pay a small fee of three hundred and sixty dollars to talk to me <laughs> for an hour. <laughs> no, you can get now, a discount, all right, up to ninety yes, percent off. Absolutely, you have for new have members. Uh, yes, we have personal advisory hours. If somebody wants to really talk to us, you know, it has to be worth. Uh, it has to be worthwhile. You know, uh, 100%. absolutely. So, so, uh, yeah, so definitely they can book an appointment with one of the advisors or one of the judges, and we'll try to help them make their kitchen kosher or whatever they need. Yes, absolutely. So, this is awesome. Perhaps we have uh, now we have the closing, we could uh, do the stuff where perhaps uh, before we do the closing statement, you know, um, we should, um, I would like to address the um, ongoing, um, progress and uh, process here with uh, Ben Zion Gagula with the um, uh, with the synagogue in Haifa and the seven laws of Noah project so as it uh, looks uh, um, looks like now one of our guys here our chief content performer from FI Media Truth will uh, stop over to um, you know to really go into this uh, issue because we um, definitely have this uh, whole issue, and I talked with Ben Zion about this, that when somebody starts, you know, and we make it very, uh, very easy, very easy, you know, for people to say, okay, you want to start the, uh, you know, the, uh, the way of Torah, okay, first accept the terms of service, Torah and prophets. So it's basically like, um, okay, yes, we, we do, uh, we did, before we didn't hear, I mean, like the Israelites in the desert. You know, like that before they even heard what it's all about, they made already the sign up. So it's like every contract, every contract today, you sign up for a cell phone contract, you sign up for a bank account. I bet well, even if you I, download an app, even before you use it, you have to have good faith and accept the terms of service even before you go in. Absolutely. So, the, so this is what we said. We, so to make it very easy, you are on this path, you want to do tshuva, okay, stick with us and we go with you the path together. So, and I think that, you know, for, for a starter, for somebody who's coming newly in, I think it's the, the uh, absolutely awesome, you know, to have, um, you know, a startup course for Seven Laws of Noah, you know, where people are getting in, where they learn the basics. And then, you know, then, okay, then they can continue. But it's like the opening port, like the opening, uh, the door into everything what follows afterwards. So I've, I find this uh, extremely important. Um, so and one of the issues is... So they, can find, they can find his course on ToraClub.com as well? Um, not yet, not yet. So this is the project we're working on. So we want to do this, uh, like, uh, you know, support uh, Rabbi Gagula in the, in the fullest extent. Um, now, one of the issues, of course, is, um, you know, that uh, we need some sort of a translator, you know. Um, <clears throat> and this, uh, you know, we think this between, let's say, the Christian world outside Israel, the Noites, and so on and so on. So they have to understand what's, what's the essence of the Jewish people. I mean, why do they have to strive for the Torah and so on and so on? There is a matter of understanding. So there has to be a certain way that we outside, you know, all the guys who, um, you know, know what we are doing, that they should really understand what is with the Jewish people and what they're all about, you know, and why do we support, have to support them? So that's number one. But the other way around, it's also true that the Orthodox Jewish community, like, uh, you know, your community, that they have to understand that there are people, yes, they are outwardly, while well, they are heathens, you know, they come and they are goyim, but they are, you know, completely on the path of Torah, like anybody who is doing tshuva, you know. 
And there has to be some sort of a translation to, to explain this. And I believe, you know, that when Alex comes, you know, he should be, um, you know, in the center of the translation process, you know, that Ephraim Media Truth is able to hand out the best information we can because nobody else is doing this. You know, what we see as historic, unprecedented and very prophetic, well, you know, I took a look, you know, at the, um, you know, on the commentaries, for example, under the, your Twitter, you know, under the Knesset Twitter video there, you know, we, we, which we earlier saw. And even some of the Jewish people, you know, they're very opposing this. They're very opposing this. They, I think they're very confused. They don't understand. Yes, exactly. How is and yes, how exactly. Exactly. They are confused. But exactly. So the Jewish people are in some way, but the Christians, the Goyim, everybody is confused. Everybody is confused. That's the whole point. You know? So only us, this is why we say, okay, who decided? Okay, pamphlet. Yeah. So after... You put a pamphlet together and it, the, the highlight should be what is an ultra-Orthodox Noahide? Yes. And in one paragraph, explain what is an ultra orthodox Noahide. Number one has to be that he denounces idol worship, including uh, Shituf, which is the partnership, which technically a Ben Noach is allowed to believe in Shituf, but this Ben Noach, this ultra orthodox Noahide, does not believe in partnership. Okay, okay the partnership number two, is the, uh, we're talking about the Trinity. Trinity, or yes. that God needs a helper of some sort. We yes. believe in Hashem the way the way the Jews believe in Hashem, higher than any image. Yes. So that I think is a very very important point that differentiates between a typical Bnei Noach and a ultra orthodox Noahide. Number two, they begin to fulfill not only the seven they fulfill the seven laws, and they additionally take upon themselves mitzvot from time to time. So they and number three, they study the Torah on a regular basis. So these three things, the fact that they are growing in the fulfillments of commandments, the fact that they are studying the Torah very, very often, and the fact that they believe in one Hashem, exactly like the Jewish people, uh, without any shituf, I think those three things puts them ahead of the other the non-Jews because even if a non-Jew is allowed to believe in Shittuf, the second he opens his mouth and talks about blasphemous things to a Jew, he's already putting himself in a bad position. But here you have an ultra-Orthodox Noahide, which he doesn't believe in Shittuf, and that's why he's much more compatible, and that's why he can study the Torah in a much more real way, and he's not getting caught up the whole time in the name of, you know, yes, whatever, yes, yes, yes. and putting it in there. Just making everyone upset and uh, and uh, and annoyed because he of his ignorance, you know. So those three things I think are the main points, and I think that that should be the title. How what what is an ultra orthodox Noahide? And yes. perhaps um, I can try also on my part to put out a a page, and, and they will do a collaboration and explain the Sanhedrin and how the nation of Ephraim has been the biggest supporter of this initiative and and, and the cutting edge on the Geula Jewish edge. So both of these things together, um, I think it's going to be a brilliant flyer that we can put out and maybe I can include it when we give out the shares. Um, oh, should we show everybody the certificates that we got today and the t-shirt? Oh yes, please, please. Yes. <laughs> okay, so let's let's pause the recording. I'll come, I'll go get it and then we'll be back in a minute. Okay, I pause the recording. Yes, we are ready. Uh, uh, let, me take a, let me take out the background one second. Uh, no background. And look at that, guys. Aye, aye, aye. This is awesome. But this looks like uh, definitely XXXL. No, it's, it's okay. It's not that big. It's fine. <laughs> but look at that. Yes, awesome. Smile Mashiach is here. It's epic. <laughs> to see the world with it, had to open it, you know, in order to give everyone the full experience. And then we have all Sanhedrin market share framed and all. 
Oh, framed and all. Honorable Noah Hyde. New oh, Noah Hyde, Mr. Of the Evil Sanhedrin Initiative Chair. There you go. For his donation and contribution for the Sanhedrin Initiative, we tr truly appreciate it. And of course, last but not least, the Machatit Hashekel. Yes. The Machatit Hashekel certificate. Noah Hyde, Mr. Ulf Diebel, with all the, with everything. And of course, the temple coins you already know. I don't have to show you temple coins. <laughs> Five temple coins for the Machatit Hashekel. Did the cup already come? Did the cup come? come? Did the cup come? Huh? Did the cup come? The cup, I know. I asked them in the door. I said, it's supposed to come together. They're like, it's not here yet. I'm like, what do you oh, mean? <laughs> but the mug is on the way. There's a mug on the way. We'll save it for the next the video. Awesome, awesome. Awesome. There's so a I mugging see. on the way. <laughs> we have a mug. <laughs> I'm really All looking right. forward to uh, to get the stuff. It's really awesome, especially the Machatze uh, Chetzi Shekel. So the uh, you had um, a special on your website. You know, perhaps you can um, show this to everybody, or perhaps you know. Mm, I yeah. So this is a certificate of the halachic requirements for Machatze Shekel, which is to help the poor. We specifically help the poor uh, Jewish people in Israel. Um, with a donation of $28 uh, to Erez, which is in charge of uh, uh, Karen Orshel Chesed here in the Golan. He helps put together food baskets and he helps the poor quietly without embarrassing them, you know. So we, we will, uh, we still have to process all the payments and everything, but definitely we're keeping track of everything that's going on. And uh, that's the certificate to show that the person yes. helped the Machatit HaShekel. Anyone that wants to uh, give Machatit HaShekel in this way. And then uh, you had that was level one. Level two is also to support the Sanhedrin, which is just like before Purim. Uh, you know, the Jewish people um, were building the Beis HaMikdash pretty much. So right now, the first step is to put the Sanhedrin together. This is actually a challenge that even the Jews in the time of Purim did not have. Because they had at least the Sanhedrin, they had what to work with. We have to start uh, kind of from scratch after this messed up exile of 2,000 years and plus. So yeah, this is why it's extremely very historic, very historic, you know. And it's um, if it wouldn't be for the hate of the Torah, you know, I mean, uh, uh, in the med uh, immediately when I saw what you were doing, I said, this is the coolest thing ever that we have to support this, you know. But this is uh, always the question, you know, uh, a lot of times we think, well, this is the coolest because it's for Hashem. And then we figure out, oh, my gosh, the others, they don't see this that way, you know. So um, and uh, we had this um, in the, ah, I showed Ben C on this, you know, on the Chabad website, on the Chabad website, you have this sighting of Moshiach. And then there is, uh, you know, all kinds. And so, uh, so the writer he said uh, what he will believe, you know, what the Moshiach will do, first thing, will do away with bad marketing. <laughs> with bad marketing. And, it, it, you know, it, it's true because, you know, when you go out, you know, uh, it, we are somehow, you know, our, um, let's say, success and how the Sanhedrin Initiative and the Seven Laws of Noah and, you know, the Nation of Ephraim and so on, and how this all developed is by good marketing. How by good, good marketing. Good marketing. <laughs> uh, only, you know, all the bad oh, marketing. It reminds me of what you said. Oops. Oh, yeah. remember we said that the Sanhedrin is going to be sitting around and then every guy is going to come and say, I'm a Shiach, I'm a Shiach. And they're going to be like, yeah, why? He's like, he's going to drag his donkey into the, in the, into the office and he's going to be like... You see this donkey? I knew I was Mashiach. I was at the zoo. I stole him. And, and you know, he's been sleeping in the back. For, uh, waiting for me to tell him it's time. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so it's going to be a crazy sight. I will oh, imagine the day that, you know, you, you already sent your files when, they, when the earlier Sanhedrin uh, opened up for cases. But imagine that the Sanhedrin now their first focus would be to find a king and they say, whoever thinks he's Mashiach, come one, come all. It's going to be like we spoke about. It's going to be amazing. We take applications now. We take applications now. 
I mean, look, you're going to have a lot of interesting stories, Ulf. You're going to have people coming there. They're going to be like, look, I burnt like 50 cars in Hawara, you know. Maybe I... <laughs> and you're going to have different... different, no, different I have, uh, you know, one of my old partners here, Eli Perez. I mean, he's a, he a candidate. He started the Perez Society, sits on the throne of David and so on. You know, he's already working on the, you know, Davidic dynasty for, I don't know, 20, 30 years or whatever, you know. Yes. So they He's are guys. Oh, yeah. But uh but I I mean we'll see. We'll see how it goes, you know. Yes. Um it, it will be definitely but I think you know the, the most important and I, I said, you know, the uh, when we are taking currently a look at the law, how it's processed, especially you know, with the left guys, you know. Uh, so number one, there has to be a very clear understanding on family issues. On family issues, you know, so um, especially with marriage contracts or divorce. Like me and David, we talk briefly yes. about that as well. Yeah. yeah, because this is where the big confusion is. The big confusion, especially yes. also, uh, you know, what is anti-Semitism and so on and so on. So now the second issue is really for business people, because business people currently they do not have any. Um, insurance of that the legal contracts in any way are somehow kept. You know, we see this now, um, you know, with what happens now with the Ukraine and so on and so on. You know, uh, money is just confiscated, business contracts are, you know, broken and so on, and people are, don't know how to get justice. So I believe that the watch over of, uh, you know, people, those people who submit to a Torah uh, the, to the Torah law, when they are able to have their contracts regulated and oversight by the Sanhedrin, I think this is one of the best services anybody can think of. You know, especially definitely. Uh, I think we should start with a like we spoke about. I will have to talk to my uncle um, on from the Justice Board, Rabbi Benjamin Edre, um, to speak to him about putting together. I think the first contract, which would be the Noahide. Um, marriage contract. I would like to put that together, and that would be the first one we will work on. And like we said, part of the terms and conditions would be that these people are getting married according to Jewish law, Kedat Moshe Israel, according to the Jewish law of, of, of Moses and Israel, and they will not, they will not uh, use the secular system in order to resolve any dispute. And the, the husband and the wife should sign it. And that would be a legal binding contract according to Torah that they take upon themselves. And, and I think that would be amazing um, uh, to start with that. And I'm again, you know, if you understand a lot of things on our plate, but hopefully we won't forget to do that. Ulf, if I want to just closing statement for me, is just that um, I want to address the protests in Tel Aviv and all these places. Yes. They're kind of trying to shut down the country. They're trying to mess with the president, prime minister's wife or whatever, shut down Tel Aviv. And honestly, the only thing I can say about it, and of course, again, like I already told you what's happening in the Knesset, but uh, you know that they're not actually trying to resolve anything. They're just whining and complaining, you know, emotionally. Um, but on the streets, I would say um, that really these protests are futile they don't mean anything because the right wing is the majority they are the democracy nobody is doing anything illegal here everything that's being done is doing exactly by the book so much so that i spoke to rabbi bar Chaim briefly and he told me you know yes i'm actually worried that that the laws that they're putting in are very parive they're still going to be judges on the vada they're still going to be judges appointing the judges the only difference that they're doing now is that they're making that the majority should be people outside of the justice system actual Knesset members or or private citizens like Professor Ram Ehrlich hopefully and so on and so on so so the, they're, they're still going to be judges appointing judges it's still going to be a thing it's just that they're not going to have the majority so there's a few laws like that i'm just giving one example that are kind of they're trying to go towards the left and trying to like please them but the left are not appreciating that 
and they don't they don't seem to even understand what's going on. They just kind of get orders from whoever they get orders. They get paid from whoever they get paid. They go out in the street and make it. It's, it's, and the Arabs are not joining the leftist protesters because they feel like this something's wrong. This These protests don't actually have a passion behind it and there's no real logical explanation for it. So that's my closing statement. I'm looking forward how this plays out. There are exciting days ahead. And um, see you soon. All together. And uh, ah, join TorahClub.com. This is where we can all connect. And to join any other initiative we put out, stay in contact with us and see you soon.